about the work that we are doing as, as a group of individuals on the Student Equity Committee, right? What it really is, it's a campus-wide effort. All of us are, are, are working on this together. And to me, um, it's a privilege to be able to do this work. I'm honored to do this work. Um, you're just uh, um, as important to this work as, as any one of us is, right? Together is what, 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 when we make this happen. It, it's that effort, that common, that community. The way G would say, Father Boyle talks about a community of kinship. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do on this campus. Right? And so, again, together we make that happen. So I welcome you here tonight. Um, I'm glad that everybody got a chance to, to be here on a Friday. Um, I had the, the, the pleasure and the honor to work with Dr. Tyrone Howard at, at a conference, actually. And uh, he moderated a, a, a panel discussion, uh, a group of individuals that had done some research together and individually, and he moderated that conversation. And um, immediately after that, I was like, man, this guy, I, 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 I hope that one day we could, our paths cross again, right? And so it turns out that our, our, our president here, uh, Dr. Dr. Beebe, also knows Tyrone, and they have done work together. So I wanna bring up uh, Dr. Beebe to introduce uh, Dr. Howard. And we'll go from there. So let's give everybody a uh, welcoming round of applause. So uh, I am so pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Howard. And um, as Luis says, uh, I had, I've had a chance to do some work with him in the past. Um, but I, I do want to also make an announcement that some of you may or may not be aware of. And that is that this last week, we were, we here at Santa Barbara City College were named the number one community college in the United States, right? Wow, wow. So, and you only get that, you only get that because of you. It, it doesn't happen. If it, if it weren't for you, we would just be another nice spot here on the beach. So you guys have made that happen and uh, you need to be proud of that. And don't, for, don't think that I haven't forgotten that it's you that makes that happen. So that's really cool. So I do have the pleasure of introducing Professor Howard, and um, I have some, some formal things that I want to talk about, but then I'll get into some more informal things with you. But first of all, Professor Tyrone Howard has a, a, an absolutely solid educational background. He has a PhD from the University of Washington, an MA in education from Cal State University Dominguez Hills, a BA from the University of California at Irvine. Uh, Professor Howard's Research is primarily concerned with academic achievement of young, of youth in urban schools. Uh, his work has centered <coughs> on the achievement gap facing African Americans and other culturally diverse students and the importance of providing teachers skills and knowledge to assist them in reversing persistent underachievement. Dr. Howard has been a member of the UCLA faculty for the last 14 years. Prior to his tenure at UCLA, he was a faculty member at the College of Education at The Ohio State University. <coughs> you gotta always make sure you get that the part in there, <laughs> right, right? Um, before entering higher education, Dr. Howard was a classroom teacher at Compton Unified School District. He's actually, he's actually a native of Compton, California. Um, and Dr. Howard is, yeah, is one of the he really is one of the foremost experts on race, culture, teaching, and learning in, in urban schools. And so that's kind of the formal part of, of his background. And there's, you know, 26, actually 26 pages to his resume. I didn't want to read all that, but it's very impressive with all of his pu publications and such. Um, but the work that, that Tyrone and I did um, related to San Diego. And uh, in San Diego, when I was the president of, of San Diego City College, right in downtown San Diego, a very urban environment, um, we were really moving in the direction of, of social justice and social change and social responsibility and ultimately put together a conference on that. And Tyrone really came and helped us understand uh, some aspects of, of race, culture, how that relates to learning, how it relates to education. And uh, then y you may or may, have, may not remember this, but I also had you come down and we, we did a, a civ civility conference together. Uh -huh. 
And uh, that, that kind of took him a little bit out of his element, but he was just fantastic with that as well. So with all of that introduction, let me, let me uh, have Dr. Tyrone Howard come up and speak with you a little bit. Thank you very much. Good uh, evening. Is it evening or afternoon? Where are we? Evening. All right. How's everyone doing? I mean, how are we really doing? Good. Okay. I can't do the lectern and stuff. I got to move. I got to walk and got to talk. I want to uh, first start off by thanking Dr. Beebe. I hope you all realize uh, what you have in uh, a leader in Dr. Beebe because when I first met him at San Diego City College, he was very unapologetic about putting a big focus on racially diverse students, students who come from low-income backgrounds, students who come from immigrant, immigrant backgrounds, students who are undocumented, and he was unapologetic about that work. You get a lot of folks who become presidents and all of a sudden they just talk political talk, president talk, and they don't really focus on those students who are the most vulnerable. He did it, he was unapologetic, and he was persistent, and I had the utmost respect for the leader that he was at San Diego City College, so you all should be grateful to have him here at Santa Barbara City College. So thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Beebe. Um, second, I want to shout out, what did Luis, so I met Luis at the American Educational Research Association Conference. When you go to these conferences, you meet a whole lot of stuffy people, right, walking around because they got all these letters and they're like using these big words and acting like they're all important. But when I was in the session with Luis, I immediately connected with him because he was real and he was genuine and he was down to earth and he didn't try to be something that he wasn't and he used words I can understand, right? And so I like, this is a real dude right here. So uh, you guys got a real winner in Luis. So I wanna say thank you, Luis, right? Uh, you know, when you grow up in Compton, you recognize real folks, right? So where are my Compton folks at? My Compton folks here? Okay, all right, Compton's in the house, right? So real, real recognizes real. So when I saw Luis, I knew he's real dude, man. So I wanna say thank you for this opportunity to come out tonight. Uh, I also wanna say congratulations to you all for being number one community college in the nation. That's huge, right? That's big, that's big. So that's cool and all, but the work is not done, okay? And we got to keep on grinding, keep on pushing, keep on building, keep getting better. Because the goal is to be the number one community college in the world, right? Uh, we don't stop at just the state or the nation. It's about, about being the best we can be on the planet. So I want to talk today about this topic around what does equity look like, and more specifically, creating access for all students. Not for some students, not for most students, not for students who have money, not for students who have privilege, but for all students, right? Because I think when we help those who are most vulnerable, everybody wins, right? That whole idea that rising tides lifts all boats, right? So if we start focusing on some of the most vulnerable amongst us, everybody wins. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the things that I think explain why we have to have this conversation, why your being here is so important. I wanna thank you for being here because Friday night, good Friday at that, you could have been a lot of other places, right? But you're here. Uh, and you being here says something about your commitment to not just your education, but education in general. So I just want to thank you. We're going to spend some time engaging around this topic of what creating access for equity looks like, okay? So before we get started, I always say we are changing the game, all right? So I want you to tweet, and I want you to... Now we're going to hashtag creating access. We're going to hashtag changing the game. We're going to access access for all. We're going to let folks all around the globe know that change is happening at Santa Barbara City College, OK? We live in a social media world. We have our story we have to tell. And the story that we're telling is that we are changing the game, right? I say that because oftentimes there's our, there are stories that are not told about communities and people who are changing the game. What do I mean by that? I always say this, if there was a shooting that happened on this campus, you'd have all kind of media who'd be here immediately, right? Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5, they'd all be here to report who shot and why, why they have these problems at Santa Barbara City College. And whenever there's something wrong or something bad, the media jumps all on this, right? But when you have young scholars who are here building their futures, taking care of their education, becoming the number one community college in the nation, where's the media at for that? Right? How come Channel 2 is not here now? How come Channel 5 is not here now? Why isn't Channel 7 here? So part of what we have to do is change the game. I think we change the game by telling your story. 
And part of why I think we need to tell the story that everyone in this room is helping to create is because you have done this by coming some overwhelming obstacles. And I want to talk you through some of those obstacles that makes your journey so important, OK? So let's kind of talk about what some of these obstacles are and then how we continue to build on those, uh, on those successes, OK? So first, my attitude of gratitude. Thank you for what you do. I'm going to ask you to do something real corny right now. You may not like it, but it's OK. Can you turn to your left or to your right and tell the person next to you, thank you for doing what you do? Can you let them know? Can you let her know? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, right? All right, she thinking the whole row, huh? I like that, right? <laughs> like, we in church, get up and hug somebody now, right? <laughs> All right, so uh, that's my attitude of gratitude. We need to acknowledge each other. We need to affirm each other because we live in a world that constantly tells us what we cannot do, what we don't have, where we fall short. And if we don't affirm each other, if we don't lift up each other, if we don't express our attitude of gratitude amongst ourselves, no one else will. So we should make it an ongoing habit to cons consistently acknowledge those who are in the struggle with us, okay? Because we are in this struggle together to be the best that we can be to improve the lives of all students, improve our neighborhoods, and give children the best chances they can be to be successful, okay? So let's kind of get into it, all right? So I want to talk about the fact that there's an ongoing battle for your minds. There's a battle for your minds that we have to fight every single day. And what do I mean by this? What kind of battle are you talking about? You said nobody's in my head. Yes, they are in your head. You just don't realize it, right? What do I mean by that? Because the, one of my famous, one of my most, most, most memorable and favorite scholars is Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And he had this statement that I think we all should understand. Dr. Woodson said that when you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. He said he will find his proper place and will stay in it. He also said you don't need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will protest until one is made for his use. His education demands it. He wrote this in The Miseducation of the Negro. Think about that for a second. He said, when you control a man's thinking, we're going to change that now, when you control a man or a woman's thinking, when you control a person's thinking, you don't have to worry about his action or her actions, right? Even when there isn't a back door, he will protest him until one is made for him, right? So why education is so important is because if you get your education, people cannot control your thinking. When you are liberated, people can't tell you what to do. But if we are not educated, then other people can control our actions. That's why it's so important for you to get all the education you can get. Because once you get that education, can anyone ever take it from you? No, you have it for life. And when you have that education, others can't control your actions, right? Understand, in this country, women, poor people, black folk, brown folk, historically were not given access to education. The goal was keep these folks from being educated because if they didn't have education, we could control their actions, right? So when you come to school every day to be better, you are fighting to control your mind, control your actions, and control your future, right? So now, let's go one step further. We have a long history of being denied access to education, and we have to understand that history. Again, if you're a woman, if you're poor, you're a person of color, you're an immigrant, you're a refugee, right? If you're queer, you are oftentimes looked at as being an other. And I'm saying we're now living in a world where the others are no longer the minorities. Now the others are the majority. So don't you let folks tell you you're a minority anymore, right? When they say the term minority, you need to say, excuse me, let me change that. We are now the majorities, right? Say it with, we are now what? The majorities, right? We are not minorities anymore, right? We are the majorities now, and understand that. Because what has happened in this country, we have a long history of trying to colonize minds. There's a book I want you to read by Joel Spring called Deculturalization in the United States. And he talks about mission schools and cultural genocide. First, they denied access to education for folks, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And then they said, OK, we're going to deny them education. Let's give them access to education, but we want them to have our education. And that education was primarily what? Western, Eurocentric education, right? We didn't want kids to learn their language. We didn't want kids to learn their culture. We didn't want kids to learn their history. The goal was let's brainwash them, right? Let's give them a Western-centric education that, that would teach them to not embrace their own culture and their own backgrounds, right? Even in school, they talk about these missions, and they tell us the missions were great places. 
for indigenous populations and brown folks, right? These missions were not great places for certain folks, right? We're gonna have real conversation today, right? These missions were places that basically we, do, we know what happened, what they raped women. They pill us, right? It's, it's sites of terrorism, right? You could not have access to education, so why do we celebrate those very things that destroyed our culture and destroyed our heritage and destroyed our future, right? But the fact of the matter is we are all remnants of people who fought and people who resisted and people who said, you will not define us based on this type of education, right? So understand, when we talk about fighting for our minds, we're fighting back against this notion that cultural genocide that tried to wipe us out, but we did not get wiped out. Right? We did not give up. Our foremothers and forefathers said we will fight and resist and resist because we believe in the power of education, right? And then we also have to understand our history also came at a price. Where some of our foremothers and forefathers paid the ultimate price. They lost their lives when they tried to gain access to education, right? They lost their lives. I'm gonna say it one more time. They lost their lives when they tried to learn how to read. They lost their lives when they, when they tried to learn numeracy. Right? That's why we have to take this serious, because there was a point in time in this country, in this state, where folks who look like the individuals in this room, if they came near a book, they'd be putting their lives in jeopardy. That's why we have to fight for education, because this thing was not always afforded to us. We are only here today, everyone in this room, present company included, because we all stand on the shoulders of women and men who fought, who hoped, who prayed, that one day their children's children's children would have access to education. That's why we do them no favors if we don't take this seriously, right? We cannot let their sacrifice be in vain. That's why you are here doing what you do every single day, because there was a point in this country where you could not have access to places like this. We have to take it seriously because the way we show gratitude for those who can be forced is by doing what? Being the best that we can be. They've blown open the doors, now it's time for us to walk through them. Plain and simple, right? So let's keep walking about, talking about these different steps we have to be mindful of that are keeping us away from this. We want equity, not just equality. Understand there is a difference between the two. Part of what we hear folks say is we want equality right here, right? Let's give everybody the same thing. Well, you can't give everybody the same thing if we're already at different places, right? Say it again, we can't give everybody the same thing if we're already at different places. If you've got $200 and you've got $2, and I say I'm gonna give you the same thing, I'm gonna give you $200 and give you $200. Guess what? The gap still remains. We want equity. Equity says we do what? We realize certain people have had to overcome more and need a little bit more in order to have the same opportunities as everyone else. Right? This making sense to folks? The idea is equity, okay? This is what we want for folks who have a history of enslavement, a history of discrimination, a history of, of colonization, a history of imperialism. We can't give you the same thing and after 30 years say you had affirmative action for, for, one, for one generation, now we're equal. We're not. We're not. So let's stop acting like I told you, we're gonna have church in here today, right? Okay, now let's keep going. So we want equity because here's what happened. Let's talk about it. The question becomes who really cares? Because there's an argument that can be made that what happens in many of our schools today tells us a loud and clear story that we care about some people's education, but we don't care about others, okay? And I want you to guess whose education we seem to care about more compared to others. So I'm gonna give you some snapshots of what messages certain young people get when they go to school every day. Here are pictures from schools in LA that begin to tell you about whether or not you think we care or we don't care about certain students, okay? Here's a high school in LA. Do we care or not care when this is the bathroom? We don't care, right? If you're a student at this school, what's the message that the school is sending you about your education? We don't care, right? How about if classrooms look like this? What's the message that we're sending? We don't care, right? What if we got desks in bathrooms? Desks in bathrooms. What if we got non-working toilets? What's the message we're sending that we care or we don't care about certain students? We don't care. So we wonder why kids drop out. Would you want to go to a school if these were the conditions? Right? So the message is being sent loud and clear who we care about and who we don't care about. Right? Now, these are schools in LA. Now, you can travel about 10 minutes away from these schools right here and go to some other schools. And these schools look a little bit different, okay? Because they're for a different population. And the message that we send to those students is something different compared to what we send to these schools, right? How about this school? 
okay? This is a high school, right? High school. What's the message we're sending to kids who go to that school? Do we care or do we not care? We care because we want you to feel proud to walk into this school every single day because we're telling you that we care about your future, okay? Let's spend a little more time in this school. Yeah, wow, I love to go. I wish I could go back to school if my school looked like that, right? <laughs> Just so I can be on the playgrounds. They have nets on the basketball rims. My school never had nets, right? <laughs> it's like, come on now. It's, all, it's clean on the, on the court, right? We had gum stuck all on it and all kind of dirty stuff. We had grass growing on our basketball court, right? So what the, what's the message? Do we care about your future? Do we not care if this is your school? We care. How about if we take a step into the uh, cafeteria? Okay, what's the message that we're sending? Do we care or do we not care? We care a lot, right? Some of us, when we were in high school, we were scared to eat the food, right? Because we thought we might die because it looked that bad, right? I would go back to high school just to sit in this cafeteria. This would make me want to go to school, right? So this is why I said we have to have equity, not equality. Because some people go to school that look like this compared to other children who go to school like the ones I showed you before. And they take the same tests. And they we're supposed to act like they're all equal when they're not. And then when those kids who, don't, who come from those first schools don't fail, we tell them it's your fault because you should have worked harder. It's your fault because you should have tried more. It's your fault because you didn't want it bad enough. Never mind the fact that you had nicer schools over here, better teachers over here, more resources over here, more counselors over here. Not the same, and we need to acknowledge it. That's why what you do for in the folks in this room, you are here oftentimes not because of schools, but you're here oftentimes in spite of schools. Schools have done everything they could have done to keep you out, to kick you down, to keep you from fighting. But we keep on coming time and time again, right? We don't give up. We keep on trying. So now, let me show you this educational pipeline of why I'm worried about we lose so many of our, of our young people and how we have to fight for the, the struggle for inclusion and equity. This is a, a, a stat showing the California education pipeline. You take 100 white students who start kindergarten, 100 African-American students who start kindergarten, 100 Latino students who start kindergarten. And then we're going to fast forward 12 years later to see how many of these 100 of each of these three, three groups graduate from high school. Let's go through the list. How many of the whites of the 100 you think graduate from high school? 83. That's a, I mean, if you get an 83 on a test, what's your letter grade? B. Okay, it's not bad, not excellent, but we'll settle for it, right? Okay, let's go to our next group. If you get a 53 on the test, what's your, what's your score on, what's your grade on that? That's an F. We're failing. 53 African Americans who start kindergarten and graduate from high school. Let's look at our Latino students. What's that one? Another F, right? So why is it that we have to explain that we have African-American, Latino students, we have less than 60 of them graduate from high school compared to 83% 83 of our white students. If I had Asian students up here, that number's about 92, 93, right? Because those first schools I show you are more likely to be occupied by who? African-American and Latino students. Let's go one step further, because of these 83 whites and these 53 African-Americans and these 50, 57 Latinos, how many get a college degree, do you think? Ooh, uh, yeah, you're like, you used to stop while you were ahead, huh? Let's go. College degree of those 80, what was 83 whites. How many do you think get a college degree? 30. Not good, right? Let's go down the line. How about of the African Americans? How many African Americans had high school diplomas? It was 53. What is it now? Our Latino population, we had what? Was that 57 had high school diplomas? Depressing, ain't it? That's why we need you here to change the game, right? That's why you have to take your education seriously, to change the game. That's why you make the sacrifices that you all make every day, to change the game. I know there are a lot of you here who are working one job, two jobs, taking three, four classes. You wake up sometimes, you are so tired, right? Your bed feels nice and warm, doesn't it? You're like, I really don't want to get up this morning, right? I really would like to stay here for five more minutes in my bed. But then you find a way to do what? Get up and go and get it done because we're changing the game, okay? And understand, this is what we are forcing uh, folks to understand, is that we are not merely statistics. We are going to change these numbers. 
I didn't say I think, I hope. I said we are going to change these numbers. You are the living proof of the fact that we're going to change these numbers, okay? And don't you let anyone tell you that you can't, right? Because now it starts earlier. We're starting to put labels on folks. Now we have data that says we began to suspend children in preschool. I said that again. Suspend in preschool. What do you do in preschool to get suspended? <laughs> right? I'm not sure. You color outside the lines. You don't sit crisscross applesauce, right? <laughs> but look, look who's getting suspended overwhelmingly. Children of color, black and brown children, are 20% of preschool enrollment, but there's 72% of the students who are suspended once and 78% of kids who are suspended more than once. How can you have 20% of the population be children of color, but they're almost 80% of the kids who get suspended, right? This is why we need those folks who want to go into early childhood education to stop this right here. Right? Because I believe that kids, you got bad kids across the board. You got bad black kids, you got bad Latino kids, you got bad white kids, you got bad Asian kids, but why do that certain kids get that bad label more so than other kids do? Right? And we know once that label gets placed on a child, you tell a child over and over again, you're a problem, you're a problem, you're a problem, after a while that child starts to think what? I'm a problem. And then you tell a child that he's a problem or she's a problem so long, they start acting like what? A problem, right? And I'm saying we're starting early. In preschool, you're what, three, four years old? So I'm saying we got to push back on these ideas that somehow we have black and brown children who can't perform well. We have a lab school at UCLA where I work, and a lot of rich kids go to that school. Average income is about a million dollars for those families in that school, right? Very wealthy school. On occasion, I go to that school and I watch the kids in that school, and let me tell you something. Some of those kids are bad, <laughs> real bad, right? But what happens is that when these kids begin to act up, they say, well, little Johnny is just really trying to express himself right now. And we just have to give him a space to express himself because he's really got a lot on his mind right now. But once he does that, he's going to be just fine, right? Now, Juanito and Malik do the same thing, <laughs> right? And they're not working through their problems. What happens with them? They got to go. Same behavior. But they get treated and get looked at very differently. I'm saying that we have to look at all behavior and say, we, we cannot accept this as just regular behavior. We can't accept these numbers when you got 20% of the population to 80% of the kids. We're kicking out of preschool. Preschool, not kindergarten, not first grade, preschool. We have to change that, okay? Now, let's go one step further. So then let's look at this issue here. Can we start kicking kids out of school? What's the next step for so many of our young people? Let's talk about the imprisonment, imprisonment situation. About one in nine men spend time in, in prison in this country, right? But again, the devil's in the details. About one in 17 white men will spend time in prison. But look at the next one. One in three black men and one in six Latino men, right? It doesn't stop with men. Same thing for women. About one in 56 women spend time in prison at some point in time. For white women, it's one, one in 111. For black women, it's one, one, in, one in 18. And for Latinas, it's one in 45. So the message that the country sends to us is that we label you as a problem, we suspend you, you drop out. This is the game we're going to change. This can't happen, this can't be business as usual because we're losing too many bright minds right here in this situation. And we have, I believe, future entrepreneurs who are behind bars, future attorneys who are behind bars, future physicians who are behind bars, future engineers who are behind bars, future computer scientists who are behind bars, but because we have created a system that pushes certain people out, we never get to recognize the full potential of these young women and men, okay? So what does this mean we have to do? Understand, you gotta read this book called Burning Down the House by Nell Bernstein. I'm a professor, I give out homework, you know that, right? Okay. <laughs> Nell Bernstein talks about the fact that in this country we have something called the prison industrial complex. People are making tons of money off of black and brown and poor bodies in this country, okay? Nell Bernstein talks about the fact that in California in 2013, we were spending about an average, she says, about $213,000 per year per juvenile inmate in this country. $200,000 per juvenile inmate, right? And we spend about $12,000 per year per pupil. So we'd rather not educate you, we'd rather do what? Incarcerate you, right? And understand there's big profit behind incarcerating black and brown bodies. We have lots of for-profit prisons in this country. For-profit prisons are designed to do what? Make money if they have empty jail cells. So they must have what in them? Bodies. 
Most of those bodies are black, brown, poor, immigrant, refugees, right? The fastest growing group of folks that we're seeing locked up now are black and brown women. The fastest, right? So I'm saying understand there's a profit motive behind this. That's why we got to fight for, for, for a fight against injustice and fight for equity. Because if we don't stand up and say this is not going to be tolerable, they'll continue to do it over and over and over again. Right? There are people out there who profit in a big way off the incarceration of young people in this country. And if you look at juvenile incarceration, it's really depressing. Because we had a project a couple years ago, we spent time out in juvenile detention facilities, and it brings you to tears to see kids 9, 10, 11 years old already incarcerated in orange jumpsuits. Right? Still babies, still children. And we know if you're incarcerated once, if you're released, you've got about an 80% likelihood that you'll do what? Right. Recidivism is the worst in this state than any other state in the country. So we've got to fight against this, all right? So your homework is to also read the new Jim Crow. You read this already? Not yet, but you're going to, right? I told you I'd give out homework, okay? Right. So Michelle Alexander talks about mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness, right? We say we're not, we say, aren't we post-racial in this country? How can you be post-racial when you've never been racial? We've never talked about racial discrimination, the history of how we've treated non-white peoples in this country, okay? So you also need to watch the documentary 13th, yeah. right? Because it shows you again how we continue to make profit and we have folks who make money off the incarceration of black, brown, black and brown bodies. Let's not educate them, let's incarcerate them, okay? That's why we gotta push back and change the game. We have a long history in this country of doing this, of criminalizing black and brown bodies, okay? Now, this is what college looks like for some folks, right? They have their dorms, they play the guitars, they got earphones, they got space, they're happy, they're getting along, right? But for other folks, this is what dorm life looks like, right? We can't tolerate this, we cannot. This is what everybody's college life should look like, right? I want to learn how to play guitar and sit across from my friend while he's not listening to me, right? And <laughs> probably because I play the guitar so bad, right? This is what it should be like for everybody. We shouldn't have a two-tier situation. But you talk to some of our young people and our older people who are incarcerated, they say it's just inhumane, the conditions. It's like sardines. You got thousands of people who are packed in these situations that were not designed for thousands of people. You got jails that were designed for 2,500 people that have 4,000 people in them, right? You put people in close proximity, guess what's going to happen? People are going to fight. You're too close to me. Don't look at me. Don't talk to me. You fight, what, what happens? More time, right? So we don't want this to be the college life. So what I need you to do, starting today, I need you to do a couple things. We're going to change the game in all that we do. First, we're going to start with some self-love. Say to yourself, say, I love me. Say it. Y'all don't mean it. Say it like you say, I love me. Tell that person next to you, you know what? I love myself. Say it. <laughs> OK? Say it again to the person to the other side. Say, I love myself. OK? So, we got to engage in some self-love. Self-love. You love yourself, that means you do all that you can to be the best at what you pursue. Every day, all day. Okay? No excuses. We also got to engage in some self-discipline. Okay? Self-discipline means that sometimes when we're tired and we don't want to study, guess what we got to do? <laughs> study. Sometimes we want to sleep an extra hour because we're tired, guess what we got to do? We got to get up, right? I know it's sometimes hard, but self-discipline forces us to say, I got to do the things that folks don't expect me to do, OK? Now, A through G, I, I got some high school students in here. My, any high school students? OK, good. You got to know what A through G is, OK? A through G is your pathway to college. So when you go to college, you will have gone there because you know A through G. You notice I said when. I didn't say if you go to college, right? <laughs> right, you. When you go to college, tell it, is, who's that next to you? Is that mom? Tell mom, say, say now, now I want her to say, say, mom, when I go to college? There you go, right, exactly, right, exactly, right, that's what I'm talking about. When she goes to college, A through G will have helps. Also, we gotta have this college and career mindset. I don't just want you to go to college, I want you to start thinking about your careers now, 
okay? Sometimes we make the mistake of putting the emphasis on college, 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 but college to do what, right? We have to think about careers. There's a difference between careers versus jobs. A lot of folks have jobs and a lot of folks can't stand their jobs, right? I'm talking about what is the career undertaking that you want where you feel like, I don't mind going to work because this is something that is my calling. Start thinking about that, not just a job, a nine to five, but a career, okay? I have to stress this one time and time again, okay? I'm gonna stress this one. We gotta love, value, and respect women, okay? All right? Look, um, I'm on a college campus, and for years I sat on the college uh, conduct committee. And we dealt with all kinds of discrepancies on the college campus. The number one issue that we dealt with at UCLA, and I've been told it's the number one issue on lots of other campuses across the country, is sexual violence and sexual assault, right? Um, and it's time for us to start having this conversation because you have lots of women who are being uh, just brutalized, being taken advantage of, being harmed, and we act as if it's not happening. And it's time for us to have this conversation now. So I tell all my men that you have to understand you came from a woman, right? What did Tupac say? You got your name from a woman, right? <laughs> right? I'm gonna start rapping up here next, right? <laughs> but understand this, I don't think there's any woman out there, there is no woman who deserves to be violated in the way that we see far too many women in this country being violated, right? Uh, there should be no reason why men put their hands on women, right? And also, I tell men that I work with that you said that no doesn't mean um, maybe not. No doesn't mean I'm not sure. No doesn't mean I'm thinking about it. No means what? No. no, right? I tell men now, you almost need to have a signed, clad contract, okay? If we're going to engage in something, let's make sure we agree on the terms. Anything less than that, you should not, in any way, shape, or form, think you're entitled to impose your will or your way on any woman, okay? I mean that. So fellas, y'all take, take to heart what I'm saying? I don't think y'all mean it. You take to heart what I'm saying here? Yeah. Okay, right. And then I had this talk at another community college and I had a, a gentleman say, well, what about the brothers? We need love too. So yeah, we're gonna get the men love too, right? Okay, <laughs> men deserve respect as well, okay? And we also have to think about community empowerment. How do we take our knowledge? How do we take our skills? How do we take our resource to make our communities and our families better? We don't help anybody if you get yours and you look back at your neighborhood and say, well, guess what? They got to figure out theirs, right? How do you give back either with your time or your talent or your resource, right? Some of you have younger siblings, younger sisters and brothers. Help them get to where you're going. Some of you have sons and daughters. Model for them what academic success looks like. Some of you have nieces and nephews and cousins. Help them get to where you're trying to go. So we got to always empower, 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 right? And we focus on changing the game and all that we do. That makes sense to folks? Yeah. All right, what else we gotta do? Uh, let's also talk about what equity looks like. It's two parts to this. First, of, first and foremost is institutional responsibility. We need to hold schools accountable, okay? We can't expect children, young people to be successful. Schools are a disaster. Remember I told you some of you are here not because of school, but in spite of school. How many of you had teachers who were just awful teachers? Yeah, every hand should go up. Because again, we had some teachers who said, I don't care if you learn or not, because I'm gonna get paid regardless, right? So we gotta hold schools accountable. We gotta make teachers teach, right? We have too many teachers who are just chilling, hard, right? <laughs> not, not helping students become the best they can become, blame students for all their problems. We gotta start making teachers teach. We gotta give more to those with the least, okay? California has the worst child poverty rates in the country. Right? We have too many kids who come to school hungry every day. Food deserts are very rampant in this state. Right? Too many children who are homeless in this state. Right? So we have to identify those who have the least and make sure we give them extra supports to be where they need to be, okay? We also need to make sure we let students speak their truth. Okay? <laughs> students speak their truth, right? I think there's a reason why we don't like to have students speak their truth because we know what students might say might hurt our feelings. Well, as the old folks used to say, sometimes the truth hurts, right? I think it's important for students on all levels to speak up. Community college, universities, grad school, right? Articulate your needs, express your wants, tell folks what you need. Last time I checked, are you not paying to come to school here? Right? This beautiful theater that we're in, guess what paid for this? 
your fees, right? All this beautiful landscaping you have, guess what pays for that? Your fees, right? The jobs of all the beautiful men and women who work here, guess who pays for their salaries? Your fees. So if you're paying for something, guess what you deserve in return? The best, right? Nothing short than that, okay? So speak your truth. So we need institutions to do their part. Schools and other institutions have to be responsible. However, schools alone and institutions alone is only part of this equation. The second part of this equation is us. That's individual responsibility, okay? You can't have one without the other, okay? There are a lot of folks who blame schools, who blame institutions, but don't look at themselves in the mirror. Conversely, there's a lot of folks who do all the hard work, but the institution doesn't do its part. We need both of these. We need institutional and individual responsibility. So that's why I need you to understand the five Ds that are so important to success. First, you got a dream. Where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? How am I going to get there? Tell people. Brag about it. Write it down. Do whatever. Don't think small. If I could just get a, a, a job that pays me $15 an hour, I'd be straight. No, why? Go bigger. Right? Don't let folks limit you. And when you talk about those dreams, there's always somebody who's going to tell you what? Why you can't do it, right? Those are the folks you got to get out of your life because all they're doing is what? Taking away, taking away. You ever have people who are just so negative about everything? Right? You know these people? <laughs> right? She's like, yeah, I know one right now. Don't say a name, right? Because that person might be here. <laughs> right? You ever see a person that, like, sometimes you see that person come like, oh, man, here he comes. Like, let me go the other way, right? And you ask simple questions like, how you doing? Man, let me tell you, I couldn't even get up this morning, man. I was, it's hard out there. I ain't got no money. I ain't got no food. I just negative, negative, negative all the time. People like that just drain you, do they not? Yeah. Find people who are going places, doing things, ambitious, right? Because their attitudes become infectious. They become contagious. They start to rub off on you. I always tell students and tell young people, look at the three closest people in your life right now. Right? And look at what each of them are doing. Right? You're like, man, let me start thinking right now. So you're like, right? But look at the three closest people. If you got two of your, two of your three closest friends are sitting at home all day playing video games and smoking weed, guess what? I'm like, man, he know my friends, right? Right? I'm saying we got to start looking at who is our circle because while we may not realize, if we look at our circle, guess what we're also looking at? Right? If your circle is made up of people who are working hard, and going places and setting goals and we talk about where we're going and they encourage each other and they lift each other up and they offer you access to resources if that's what your circle looks like stay there right but if your circle is full of people who tell you what you can't do and what you won't do and you think you're better than everybody else and you should stop going to school you got to cut so you got to cut some of those folks and i hate to say this sometimes the most negative folks are folks in our own families that's a hard one to make sense out of, right? So you got to dream big, right? But dreaming big is not enough. A lot of people dream, but they don't do anything once they dream. They dream and they go right back to sleep, right? <laughs> so I need you to make sure that you not just dream, but you also have to have discipline. That means you got to get up and go every day. You got to study when you're tired. You got to work when you're tired, right? You got friends who want to hang out. You got to say, I can't hang out today. That favorite TV show was on. You got to say, you know what? I'm going to just DVR right now. I'm going to watch it later after my midterms. Discipline is doing all those things that you know you should be doing, but you find reasons to not do, right? How many times you get home and you know you got to study and you're sitting at home and you find everything else in the world to do other but that homework? I think I need to sweep the floor, yeah. right? <laughs> I need to clean the refrigerator, <laughs> right? Paint the house, right? <laughs> We come up with everything except that thing. We'll find everything. Then we'll sometimes, we'll sit at the table. We think, okay, wait a minute, what else can I do? What else can I do? What else can I, oh, I got to call somebody. Stop it. Do what you got to do, right? I love the movie, The Great Debaters. Denzel Washington had a line in it. He says, we do what we got to do so we can do what we want to do, right? We do what we got to do so we can do what we want to do. That takes discipline, doing the thing that other people won't do, right? There are folks who say, look, it's 9 o'clock, I'm asleep. Well, guess what? I got to stay up till 10 because I got to study, right? I'm only taking one class. Well, guess what? I got to take two because I'm trying to get to that certificate or to that AA degree. Discipline means you force yourself to be on a regimen every day to do the things that we know are hard to do. And you got to be dedicated, right? I somebody spelled dedication wrong. Right? You got to be dedicated to, to spelling properly, right? How about that? So how about the fact that you have dedication? You got to be one who's, who's committed to your task, your dream every day, right? 
You gotta make sure you're talking to counselors if you're here at, at Santa Barbara City College. Sometimes that counselor's line is so long, you're like, you know, I don't even want to trip. No, stand in that line, right? And wait until you get that time there. Sometimes you go to office hours, there's like 10 people there. You're like, ah, uh, no, stay there. That's what dedication is all about, okay? You gotta be determined. Well, you're gonna say, you know what? Nobody's gonna tell me what I cannot do. Nobody's gonna tell me what I can't accomplish. Nobody's gonna tell me what I can't achieve. Plain and simple. That's what desire is about. You want it so bad that people can put brick walls in front of you. You're gonna find a way to, to either get over those brick walls, go under, if you have to, go through them. That's what desire is all about. Remember, you're here because people who came before us have far more obstacles than what we did. And they did what they did so we could have these obstacles. I need you to have these five Ds to dream, to have discipline, have dedication, determination, and to have this desire. If you don't have it, you're not gonna get equity. We're not gonna have success, right? So understand this. Some of you deal with these things that my dear colleague, racial, uh, 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 Danny Solorson will call racial microaggressions, right? You know about this, Louise, right? These folks who make these little subtle comments to you all the time, right? They think they're being complimentary, right? But they say things like, my, you're so articulate. What'd you expect, right? <laughs> Your kids behave so well. What'd you expect, right? I had a colleague of mine who teaches physics, one of my former uh, students, he teaches physics at a high school, Latina. She said she showed up the first day of class. The principal said, ah, oh, you must be the new Spanish teacher. She said, no, I'm the physics teacher, right? These comments that folks make that constantly put folks down, right? Perpetrators are oftentimes unaware, oh, you're just being super sensitive, right? We have to fight with those kinds of comments, right? Where people say these things to us based on gender, based on race, where they start to lead us to question our own intellect, right? Did that person follow me in the store because I'm black or brown, right? My son used to do this thing. He would say, Dad, watch him walk to the store. I'm just walking around in circles and watch the white, pay, watch the white lady follow me, right? <laughs> and he would walk around the store, and guess what the white lady would do? She'd follow him, right? They're walking around in circles, right? <laughs> around in circles, right? Right, and the whole time he's doing that, you probably got a, another person stealing half the stuff in the store, right? <laughs> My wife just happened to her, we were at the airport, right? At the airport, and what was the store? Was it Michael, Michael Kors, right? Three pe white people walked into the, like, into the store, and the lady was like, on them. Because the, the assumption is that what? Right, that you're going to try to steal something, right? Really? Like, you know, I probably got more money in my bank account than your family has all together, right? But they look at us as if we're criminals. So I'm saying part of what we, feel we face are these microaggressions, cuts across all social identities, right? Comments are miscompliment, but they oftentimes are put down. You gotta fight against that. So understand, we also have to acknowledge that this is one of my favorite quotes. Paul Lawrence Dunbar says, we wear the mask. We oftentimes wear the mask to cover up our pain that we're going through, right? We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile. That's why I have so much admiration for folks who are here because we're doing this in the face of adversity every single day. Women, you do it in the face of patriarchy that's hitting you every single day, right? You wear the mask, you're still persevering. Folks of color, you do it in the face of white supremacy every single day. You wear the mask, fighting against folks who tell you what you can't do. My queer folks, you do it every day in the face of heteronormativity that tells you that you are somehow not normal, right? You wear the mask. Immigrant folks, you wear the mask every day when we have xenophobia that's rampant, constantly making it out that people who are not from this country are the problem, right? So I'm saying we wear the mask every day, and that comes at a cost. So that's why I need you to make sure you take care of yourself, right? One more time, tell that person next to you, say, take care of yourself, tell them. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself, right? Because understand this. Some of us have what I call the triple quandary. Where are my poor women of color? Again, if you're poor, if you're a woman, and you're a person of color, you got the triple quandary working against you. You live in a white supremacist, white supremacist, classist, patriarchal society. We can throw in immigrant status, and that can bring another. You got four strikes in the game, it's three strikes and you're out. That's why you have uncanny strength and uncanny resilience, because you still rise every single day, right? So understand this, game recognizes game. So I see you every single day. I see you fighting, I see you struggling, I see you trying to hold on to your humanity in the face of oftentimes inhumane circumstances. So you gotta recognize your history. 
as I said at the outset, recognize the fact you stand on the shoulders of women who fought and died for these opportunities. You fight, you recognize your history to understand that education was oftentimes not designed for us, but when we get a little bit of access to it, we take it to the next level. Right? Recognize our history, recognize our brilliance and potential. There's a whole lot of intellect in this room. Whole lot of talent in this room. Whole lot of innovation in this room. There's somebody here who's gonna find a cure for cancer. Somebody here is gonna help us figure out how we can get to Mars. You know, when we get to Mars, we're gonna have a whole another way of getting there. We're gonna have music bumping, we're gonna have the whole thing lined up, right? <laughs> we do things a little bit different, right? So we gotta recognize our brilliance and potential. You gotta recognize our common struggle. We gotta stop this black-brown conflict, right? Because it's counterproductive. We got far more in common. Right? We got far more in common than we have that's different. Don't let folks manipulate these, these artificial beats because they're not real. There's power in numbers. We can't say I'm all for ending racism, but I don't want to fight against sexism. Right? We need to have men fighting to end sexism, not only women. We need our white brothers and sisters fighting to end racism, not just the folks of color. Right? We all have to find our common ground. We need straight folks helping to fight against issues around heteronormativity, right? We can't always let the folks who are in that category fight that struggle. We all have to fight it, right? How many times we're in classes, somebody says something off, and they want to turn to the person of color to say, okay, what's the thing that we're supposed to say or do, right? All eyes go to the Latina because now it's Cinco de Mayo. Like, stop, stop. We got to recognize our common struggle. And recognize that our minds, our lives, our families, and our communities are at stake. That's why we got to get this right. This is bigger than us. This is about the folks who will come after us. Our daughters, our sons, our grandchildren, all the folks who are unborn. We have to make sure that when we leave this earth, we've left this place a little bit better than how we found it when we first got here. We have to, okay? Also understand, before we close, look, I know we struggle, but to live is to suffer. To survive is to find some meaning in the suffering. Think about that. Your struggle means something. How do you learn from that struggle? How do you grow from that struggle? How do you benefit from that struggle? And how do you share that struggle with others so they can avoid it? So don't become victims of your circumstances. Become empowered by your circumstances. Tell folks your story and how you overcame the adversity to get to where you are. We all have some kind of adversity we have to face. But I always tell folks, I tell my own children, like when you, when you, when you fail that class or you don't get a good test on a particular uh, uh, exam, you can't feel sorry for yourself. It's just a setback. And we always say a setback is a setup for a comeback. How are you going to come back? Plain and simple, okay? Now, look folks, the dream is free, but the hustle is sold separately, okay? You got to want this bad. You got to hustle every day. You got to find a way out of no way. You got to fight when you have no fight left in you. You got to push when there's no push left in you. You got to climb when there's no climb left in you, right? This is what we do. The dream is free, but the hustle is sold separately. So I know you want to dream, and you should keep dreaming, but you also got to push and fight and never relent on your goals and your dreams and your accomplishments, right? Because I always say that part of what we are, we're the roses in the concretes. That's what we are. Nobody expected us to be here, right? Nobody expected women to be in an institution of learning. Nobody expected folks of color to be in an institution of learning. Nobody expected poor folks to be in an institution of learning. You are the roses in the concrete, like Tupac said, right? Because you grow not out of rich soil. You grow not out of fertile ground. You grow out of the rough concrete. They say, how do roses grow in the concrete? Well, look around. You are the living embodiment of that, right? I love Pac when he says, you, should, you wouldn't ask why the rose that grew from the concrete had damaged patterns. On the contrary, we would celebrate its tenacity. We would love its will to reach the sun. And he says, we are the roses. This is the concrete. And these are my damaged petals. And then I love how he concludes. He says, the question is, don't ask me why, ask me how. I'm looking at the roses from the concrete. I'm looking at folks who did all the things that folks said that could not be done. I'm looking at all the folks who refused to give up. All the folks who defied the odds and said, I won't be a stereotype, I won't be a statistic. You are the roses from the concrete. I'm looking at your damaged petals. And I'm not asking you how, right? I'm not asking you why, I'm asking you how. Because I need you to keep doing that every single day because people are depending on you. People need you. People are watching you every single day. You inspire me, 
right? I see folks struggling. It makes me want to fight and struggle more. That's why we have to take this serious with every single day to fight this fight for equality and, and equity with all of our might, because this is bigger than us. It's about the folks who came before us and about the folks who came after that. So we got to fight hard with everything we got. When I was growing up in Compton, I always said when things got real intense, we used to say, you know what, you think I can't do something? I'm going to prove to you that I can, right? People say, I dare you to do something, right? We say, OK, well, I, you dare me, I'll do it. But when the stakes got higher, we say, I don't just dare you, I'll do what? Double dare you, right? But sometimes we didn't stop that double dare, right? Talk to me. Triple, triple dare you, right? And then if we really, really got serious, we say, I don't just triple dare you, I do what? I triple dog dare all you guys. Thank you for changing the game. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I triple dog dare you. What's up? What's up? So, so we're gonna um, we're gonna open up for maybe a few questions, comments. Um, um, I, I say this, right? Um, he said, uh, "Real sees real, right? Real sees real." And uh, uh, like for you being here again, real sees real. And this is a commitment to to getting it right, right? We have a, a lot of work to do. It doesn't end with the presentation, right? It doesn't end while you're here. We have to take this information and make it happen in our community. Our people need us, right? Those, those young kids, they need us, right? We need to do what we got to do, and not only for ourselves, but for, for the greater good, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so, I, again, I'm, I'm honored to have Tyrone here, Dr. Howard. Um, um, I'm glad that he was able to make it up here. Um, Santa Barbara needs more of this. We need to continue this. It doesn't end with Dr. Howard. We all have our responsibility to go out and make this happen, right? So I'm going to open it up if you, if you have a question or a comment, and we'll continue the, the conversation for a little bit and go from there. So if, if, if you want, just, right, anybody? Ms. Lancaster? Yeah. <laughs> right here you go. Question up here in the front. Hands up, yes. So it couldn't come just perfect timing because, I mean, we had Barack Obama that came from nothing and become the U.S. president. And he had to study, you know, and fight his way up and uh, obtain so many degrees and, and be president at Harvard, um, mm -hmm. the law review, and then, you know, become president. Mm -hmm. And now we have this white guy that hate us uh, to Latinos they say we come here to rape and, and rob and to qualify to the White House he was just rich and white education mm -hmm. just I mean no grad school yeah. so I think I think the way I appreciate your comments Caesar I think the way we resist that is by doing all the things that folks like you are doing I think every day that you complete a class every day that you get a little bit closer to your milestone you destroy that stereotype that says that Latinos can't be successful, right? And so I always say that there's actually that, that, that the proof is in the pudding. What you do every single day uh, destroys all that negative thinking that folks have about us. That's why I tell my students, you have two choices. You either can reinforce the stereotype that folks have about us, or you can destroy it. And I think all the folks in this room are doing the very thing we need more folks to do by destroying that stereotype. So I thank you for doing what you do. You deserve a round of applause. I appreciate it. My name is Crystal. Um, I work for Luis, so thank you, thank you for coming out. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. 
So um, I am um, involved also in the Black Student Union. I'm the vice president of the Black Student Union. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and one of the things that I found is very challenging is um, it is very hard to get black students to participate in a lot of campus stuff or mm -hmm. make them feel welcomed mm -hmm. on this campus. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you had like any advice on things yeah. that like we could do or how we could reach out to the black. Yeah, no, I know a little bit about that because when I was in college, I was vice president of the Black Student Union and I had the same problem then. Folks would not show up. We had the socials, everybody would show up, but the meetings, <laughs> nobody shows up, right? Um, <laughs> I think you need to tell people we're having a party when you're really having a meeting, right? And they'll be surprised. <laughs> uh, but no, I, it's, it's a common problem at a lot of colleges. The thing I would do is, is I would just start approaching people when you see them on campus. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell them who you are. Tell them about the BSU. A lot of folks don't even know what BSU is. Uh, you just have to make it a point to let folks know what's available, why their experiences can be enriched by becoming part of the BSU, and why the BSU needs them, right? It's a mutually beneficial situation. The BSU can benefit these students, but the students can also benefit BSU as well. Um, so I think it just requires more concerted effort to just talk to people, invite people, uh, you know, signage all over the place. Uh, try to find the times that are most ideal for people to attend. But uh, look, then tell people who do come. You get six people who show up, say, okay, look, how about next meeting, each person brings one other person with her or him, right? Now you've got 12 people that come there. Then you try to do the same thing, okay, of these 12 people, of 24. So you're trying to get to slowly build over time. But I also tell you this, though. Um, don't be discouraged too much by who's not there. Be focused on who is there. Uh, and I'd rather have five or six people who are committed to doing the work that you all are doing as opposed to having 100 people who you can't rely and depend upon, right? So push to get more folks involved. But if it's you and two other people, do the most y'all can do, all right? And keep going from there. Thank you for your leadership. I appreciate that. Hello, <clears throat> my name is uh, Matthew Escare, and I'm currently on the Associate Student Government at Santa Barbara City College. First off, thank you for speaking, it was thank wonderful. You. Second off, do you have any advice for how, uh, as a student representative, I can help out these groups institutionally or just through the, the student government route? Right, well again, like the young lady here said, I think what we have to do is we have to encourage more of our students to get involved in leadership. Um, I would say let's look at the composition or the makeup of, uh, of the student body leadership. If it's mostly male, then we need to say, okay, why aren't more women involved? Uh, if it's mostly white, we have to say, why aren't more folks of color involved? And I think it means outreach of talking to folks who are in the different organizations, MECHA, BSU, uh, the different kinds of ethnic studies courses and going there and encouraging folks. Our organizations are better when we have more diverse people because more diverse perspectives are able to come, more diverse experiences are better. So I think we have to recognize that there's strength and diversity, and I think it means helping folks understand that we truly want their input, we truly want their perspectives. We can't just sit back and wait to see who comes knocking at our door. I think we have to be much more aggressive in pursuing folks and saying, look, uh, you were in a class with me. I liked some things you said. I think you'd be great uh, in leadership. I think you should consider running. These are things that will help out your resumes in due time, folks. Uh, it looks good when you can say to a college or university or to a job that I was involved in student leadership. That shows your ability to manage multiple things at one time. So it is really, 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 really good to start building that resume now. So I would say uh, just talk to folks, encourage folks, uh, really try to impress upon folks the values of leadership. Uh, you can't complain about things to be involved in that change, right? I always say be the change that you like to see by getting involved. That's like folks who don't vote. Like, okay, once you choose not to vote, then I shouldn't hear your mouth at all because you gave up your opportunity, right? So same thing with your campus organizations. If you don't like what's going on on campus and you don't get involved in leadership, shame on you. So thank you for your leadership. I appreciate it, right? Hello, my name Hi. is Lindsay. Um, Dr. Howard, thank you for everything that you shared. Um, as a student here, I often have um, a lot of comments that I would like to offer to my professors when they're referencing uh, certain groups of people. I had a teacher um, reference 
undocumented citizens as illegal aliens in one of my classes in a lecture with over 100 people in them. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to call them out on it and say, mm -hmm. like, look, that's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. another part of me also thought, like, oh, I'm this brown woman, and he's going to remember that when he's grading my midterm. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to say that. <laughs> right, <laughs> you right, know? right, right. So right. Um, what I am wondering, like, since you're a professor, mm -hmm. what would your advice be when you hear um, these comments that are offensive, would yep. you rather have your student tell you in front of your 100 plus lecture, or mm -hmm. would you rather have them talk to you That's uh, a privately? great question. Great question, Lindsay. So to me, I want to know. If I've messed up, I want to know in real time. So I personally would not mind if a student told me in a group of a thousand people that you said something that's offensive or something that's dehumanizing. But that's me, right? Uh, a lot of professors feel very much challenged by someone questioning what they said. So I think you were wise in trying to figure out what might be the best approach because as much as some folks say they don't remember people who make comments that they think might be a challenge to them, they do, right? And so maybe the best approach is to have a one-on-one -on -one with that instructor and tell him why you found those comments to be inappropriate. But the real important thing you can do, Lindsay, and I tell this to all students on college camps, and I don't think students understand the kind of power you have in this regard. At the end of every course, we ask you to do what? Evaluations. Evaluations. Most students, because they're so sick and tired of the class, and they're like upset about the final, thinking that they didn't do well, most students don't complete the evaluations. And that is your chance to really get back at folks you may not have liked. Because all departments, and Dr. Beebe can tell you, right? All departments look at the evaluations of every single professor on every campus. Our raises get tied to those evaluations. Our, our, our promotions get tied to those evaluations. Our abilities, in some cases, if you're untenured, to, get a, to keep your job is tied to those evaluations. So I always tell students, take about 10, 15, 20 minutes to give thoughtful feedback on those evaluations. Tell that professor how much you loved her or him and give the specifics and the details of what made that professor so amazing because that's going to increase the likelihood that that professor is going to stay on the campus and continue to have those opportunities. If you have a professor who is very inappropriate and very uncaring, say that. Give details. Give examples. Just take the time out because those things are your ways of speaking back to folks who don't oftentimes realize what they've said or done that has, that has caused you to feel hurt, pain, or, uh, or disrespect in some kind of way. But also understand, you have to pick and choose your battles. Can't fight all of them. Because if you fought every battle, you'd be here fighting more than you would be learning. And I want you to move to, to accomplish whatever goals you have for you educationally, if it's a certificate, if it's your AA, or whatever your goal is. Because some folks are in the business of just professional fighting on college campuses. And I'm saying, that's great, that's important, but I need you to move through here and move on to the next level and keep on, uh, keep on going toward those educational goals. So I appreciate your question, Lindsay. Any other comment, question? So it comes out of the live stream. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, in terms of, of institutional responsibilities, right, I didn't hear you touch on mental health at all. Oh. And yes. um, I think that's absolutely critical, mm -hmm. especially for our students from the margins, right? Our formerly incarcerated students, our mm -hmm. students in recovery, our single parents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our rape and multiple trauma survivors, right? Yep. So yep. can you touch on that a little bit and really fill yeah. spaces, language justice yep. in those spaces yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, what yeah. that needs to look like? Excellent question. Thank you for that. No, uh, part of what I talk about when I say we wear the mask uh, is wearing the mask is oftentimes trying to cover the pain uh, and the suffering that many of us encounter. Uh, and sometimes it's a need for all of us uh, to think about some mental health check-ins and check-ups, right? Uh, because if you're constantly being on the margins, uh, dealing with trauma, dealing with stress, uh, we have a, a growing number of homeless students on our campuses, uh, a, a growing number of uh, former foster youth on our campuses, uh, a growing number of veterans, women and men who have, who have fought uh, for this country, who come back with lots of PTSD uh, symptoms. So yeah, I think we have to talk about mental health. It's yet one of those topics, again, that we don't want to acknowledge, despite the fact that there are large numbers of folks uh, who are going through their own challenges. Uh, I think we've got to make sure that our institutions are having the kinds of appropriate mental health supports on every single corner of our campuses so that if students understand that those resources are there, that they use them, right? Uh, and I think we have to start talking about the fact that it does not make you weak 
to go see a therapist. Uh, it does not mean that you are soft, man, if you go see a therapist. Uh, it does not mean that you're inadequate if you don't go talk to uh, a, a psychologist. I think it shows a sign of strength to do just that, right? Some of us have friends who we need to walk over to our counseling um, um, centers to, to, to see someone. Some of us may need to make the trip over to talk to someone. And there's nothing wrong with that. To me, it's a sign of strength for that person to take the willingness and take the step to say, I need help, right? Uh, because again, I talked earlier about the fact that you are oftentimes here in spite of lots of obstacles you had to overcome, and that takes its toll. Some of you are doing so much. You're taking care of yourselves. You're taking care of children. You're taking care of parents. You're taking care of siblings. Uh, you're working multiple jobs. You are barely holding on. And you're thinking like, I am this close to just saying to hell with all this, right? And no one seems to understand. No one seems to support. No one seems to get, have your back. That's when you might find yourself going to talk to a counselor and I need help because I don't know how I'm going to get through the day or through the week. You want to add on? Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. So I think that's one of the kind of radically inclusive things we can do on campuses, right? Is to is to decentralize Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Right. And I think you said something important earlier about um, so having adequate services on campuses, but also having folks who have the cultural competence to engage with folks around this. Because oftentimes I've had students at my campus say. You know, Dr. Howard, I finally decided to, to muster up the courage to go talk to a therapist, but this guy completely did not understand who I was. I didn't feel comfortable talking to him, right? So the cultural competence piece is huge. That doesn't mean necessarily having, uh, I think it's important to have counselors of color, right? But I'd rather have counselors of consciousness more so than the counselors of color. Because some folks, let's be clear, skin color does not always equate with consciousness. And part of what we have to have is folks who have the cultural competence to understand how to engage with the diverse population. So I appreciate your point, you're spot on. Thank you so much for that. You gotta, so we have they, one they, more question. They're getting, your, they're getting your exercise in, Luis. They yeah, got you running I'm, all I'm over the place, out, huh, yeah. man. It's your workout, I got, huh? I got one more question and right. then, uh, um, Yeah, you don't have to go we'll to the gym tomorrow, brother. You get yeah, it all yeah. in today. <laughs> Sorry, Luis. Uh, my question is going to go in a slightly different direction, and That's that fine. is that um, we, I think when we're talking about uh, creating equity, yes. um, we are so focused uh, specifically on the student portion, which is appropriate, yes. I think, to do. Yes. But when we, when we don't focus on staff and faculty, yes. Yes. I think we miss a big layer because no, staff, agree. when we, first of all, we need staff and faculty of color. Yes. Um, and when, but when the staff and faculty of color are marginalized yes. on campus, then yes. we become less effective for the students yes. as well. Yes. So yes. have you have you done any work with that? Uh, yes. At all. I'm gonna say, amen, sister, amen, sister. Right? Yeah. No. So I'm. So forgive me for not addressing that. I think you're right. So students are the are the are the the lifelines of our work, but students can't be as great as they are without the support from faculty and staff. And I've been to a number of community colleges across the state where um, the same kinds of challenges that we know students are facing, faculty and staff are facing as well. Oftentimes overworked, uh, undersupported, undercompensated. And so, yeah, so I think there's a need. You've got a, a great president who will listen. He's here, right? Um, uh, I, he's always been, in my interaction with Dr. Beebe, someone who has been uh, a good listener and who's tried to respond to all um, constituents of his community. So I think we need to be very strategic about how do we, A, increase the diversity of our faculty and staff, right? But also provide the uh, adequate supports for our faculty and staff. The very things that the young lady up top talked about in terms of services for students, we need to also make sure that faculty and staff have those same services available, right? Because, look, we talk a lot about this notion of what's called secondary traumatic stress. So we talk about trauma that young people deal with, that older people deal with. But what we don't talk about is when you're a person who is in the service industry, i.e. staff or faculty who are serving those folks, you can start taking on signs of stress and trauma and not even realize it because you're constantly servicing those who are in trauma themselves. So we gotta take care of those folks who are on the front lines, those faculty and staff members who work countless hours, uh, who give a lot, and I know there are days when you're like, okay, I'm about to finally go home and walk to my car, and you think you got a beeline to your car, and guess what, and that student finds you, right? <laughs> and, they got, and they say, can I take five minutes of your time, right? I just want five minutes of your time, and then an hour later, you're still there, right? 
and then you try to make a, 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 a every day. Then you try to say, okay, I think I finally got a beeline to my car. Then around the corner comes what? Another student. I need like five minutes of your time, right? So we have to acknowledge, we have to lift up, we have to support all of our faculty and staff for doing this work. They don't do it for the money because believe you me, it's not a lot, right? They do it because of the care and the concern and love that they have for students. So let's give a big shout out to all our faculty, staff, and students. So Luis said I, I can ask one more thing. Okay, Sorry. good. He said as long as you were close, he didn't want to run all the way back <laughs> into the back, right? Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> my, my name is Mia, and I just, um, you know, I'm, I'm here. My daughter is still in high school. Outstanding. And, um, the one who's going where? Yeah. That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. And um, as a Native American parent, um, I want to know um, one thing that we've been really trying hard to do is create spaces that our kids can find other kids um, of Native ancestry of, you know, and I wonder if you have seen on other campuses um, reaching out to community. For example, here, um, this is our village. This is actually a village site here. It's our, actually our ancestral village. Mm. So when the students come here, I worry about the students that are Native American because some of the students that come from um, very Native populated areas come here and they recognize that in this place they should have some kind of protocol. Mm -hmm. Have you seen um, in other places um, the college students, the, the s actually the facility, the institution, mm -hmm. reach out to the communities to help create a space like that so that children or you know, students can be welcomed by the families and mm -hmm. the people of the place? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I, that's, a, a, that's an excellent question. And um, I've not seen many, and let me tell you my, my opinion why I think we have not seen many. By and large, institutions just don't wake up one morning and say we're going to do something that's great on behalf of uh, indigenous populations. Um, institutions tend to operate in ways that support their own uh, sort of missions and values and backgrounds. Institutions only change when people who feel like there should be recognition put pressure on institutions to be better, right? So I know, for example, at UCLA, we have a uh, American Indian Studies uh, Department, uh, and there are some protocols there within certain parts of the campus, but that only happened because there were small pockets of indigenous populations and their allies who said that we think that there should A, be a center, B, there should be uh, a major, and C, there should be spaces that are there to support indigenous populations. And so I think the only way that's going to happen here is that there are folks who are consistently communicating with folks in leadership to say that we deserve, we want, we need to have a space that recognizes uh, our ancestral heritage, that also uh, that recognizes uh, this space and place uh, that may have been very sacred land for uh, certain populations. I think only then will those institutions begin to respond accordingly. So I wish I could say I saw, I've seen lots of examples, but unfortunately I've not. And the, the, the couple that come to mind are typically uh, uh, in place because there's been uh, massive resistance, lots of pushback, community building and organizing to put pressure on institutions to do what's right on behalf of um, you know, one of the populations that we rarely talk about uh, that has been decimated through, uh, you know, through, through this cultural genocide I talked about, decimated through uh, a lot of the, the acts that this country engaged in. So I think that's a history that we cannot forget, right? That's one that we all should know and understand because it's something that was unthinkable and that should never be forgotten. So I appreciate you raising that question and concern. Um, so as you heard, I'm Native American, and I was just wondering like, if you have any advice for like, if I feel like appropriated in my classroom, like when I'm on the spot, because I feel like it's easier when I have people to back me up, but when I'm in the classroom and there's no one to back me up, what do I do? Excellent question. Where are you going after you leave here? To college. Oh, college. <laughs> to college. I'm going to keep on saying that over and over again, right? Um, so yeah, this is unfortunate. So I'm going to make this comment. Tell me your name? Kelly. Kelly. Not to Kelly, but to everyone other than Kelly. And what I'm going to get at is when there are comments that are made that make you feel, um, you know, sort of otherized, if you will, uh, it should not be up to Kelly and Kelly alone to have to respond to that. 
right? Oftentimes what happens when we sit in classrooms and we have folks who make really inappropriate comments, we all know the comments are inappropriate, right? And we all kind of turn to the person who's been victimized and we just kind of sit there and let that person kind of sit on the spot. I'm saying the rest of us have to be courageous enough to be able to say, what you just said to Kelly was out of line and inappropriate, right? What you just said to Kelly really has no place here. What you just said to Kelly is unacceptable, right? So we all have to step up because guess what? It's Kelly and her group today, but guess whose group is gonna be tomorrow, right? And we don't wanna be in that situation when someone makes a comment that's inappropriate about the group that we are a member of and we're feeling alone on the island as if no one has our back. The worst thing to do is to feel like you're alone when everyone knows that you've been targeted or you've been attacked in some kind of way that they know that they would not to be targeted. So I'm saying to you, Kelly, what can you do? I hope that folks in your classes and folks in this room will speak up and speak out and get in the way and make sure that you don't have to suffer like that by yourself. Because no student, regardless of his or her background, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation should have to be subjected to any kind of uh, dehumanizing or deculturalization about their identity. So my thing is, be proud of who you are, never apologize for who you are, and never change who you are. Right. So, thank you, Dr. Howard. Thank you, Dr. Beebe. A wonderful presentation, wonderful discussion. One, one last round of applause. Thank you, everybody.